live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE, covering Red Hat Summit 2019. Brought to you by Red Hat. And good morning, welcome to Beantown, Boston, Massachusetts, Stu Miniman's hometown, by the way, at least town of residence. Uh, John Walls with Stu Miniman here on theCUBE at Red Hat Summit, and Stu, for you, uh, good to see you here at a home game. Yeah, John, thanks so much. Very nice to have uh, for you, 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 you know Boston, uh, the Cube loves Boston. Yeah. Uh, the BCEC is actually where the first Cube event was way back in 2010, and we wish there were more conferences here in Boston. Gorgeous weather here in the Fantastic, spring. Yeah. Uh, a little chilly at night with the, with, the, with the wind coming off the water, but really good here. It's the sixth year we've had the Cube here at Red Hat Summit. My fifth year at the show. Uh, great energy and uh, you know, 34 billion reasons why uh, <laughs> people are spending a lot of time uh, keeping well, a close let, eye let, on Red Hat. Let's but, jump in on you know, that right let's, away. Uh, yeah. Yeah, let's ju jump right in. $34 billion deal, <laughs> IBM Red Hat. Got approved by DOJ. Uh, here in the States, but there's still some hurdles that they have to get over in order for that to come to fruition. Maybe later this year, that's the expectation. But just your thoughts right now about, about that synergy, about that opportunity that that we think is about to happen. Yeah, so, so right, let's get this piece out of the way because here at the conference, we're talking about Red Hat. The acquisition has not completed, so while the CEO of IBM, you know, Ginny, will be up on stage tonight along with you know, Jim Whitehurst, CEO of Red Hat, and Satya Nadella, you know, flying in from it's Seattle it's where he was at Microsoft get Build names, right? uh, yesterday. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, at least uh, two of those three are CUBE alums. So, uh, yeah, yeah. we'll get Ginny on one of these days. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is a big acquisition, the largest software acquisition ever, and third largest acquisition in tech history. Now, mm -hmm. we watched the first biggest tech acquisition in, in history, which was Dell buying EMC just a couple of years ago. And this is not the normal, okay, hey, we announced it, and you know, it closed quietly in a few months. So as you mentioned, DOJ approved it. There's a few more government agencies Europe needs to go through. You never know what China uh, might ask uh, to come in here, but you know, really at the core, um, if you look at it, you know, IBM and Red Hat have worked together for decades. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we wrote a lot about this when the announcement happened. You know, IBM is no stranger to open source, IBM is no stranger to Linux, and the areas where Red Hat has been growing and expanded to, you see IBM there. So uh, Kubernetes, uh, you know, super hot space. Um, if, you, if you look, you know, Red Hat is there. Uh, their OpenShift platform, which is what Red Hat does for cloud native development, has over a thousand customers, and they're adding between 100 and 150 a quarter, is what they talk about publicly. Uh, we're going to have some of those customers on this week. So huge area, that multi-cloud, hybrid cloud world absolutely is, is where it, it, it's at. Uh, we did four days of broadcast from IBM Think mm -hmm. earlier this year in San Francisco. And you know, once again, Jim Whitehurst and Ginny were on stage together there talking about where they've been working together for a long time. And just, you know, some things will change, but from IBM's standpoint, they said, look, you know, the day after this closes, you know, Red Hat doesn't go away. Uh, Red Hat just announced new branding and everybody's like, well, why are they changing their branding mm -hmm. you know, when you know, IBM's taking over? And, and the answer was, look, Red Hat's going to stay as a standalone entity. IBM says they're not going to have a single layoff, not even HR consolidation, at least at the beginning. We mm -hmm. understand, you know, give them a year Things or stuff so to work out some of these pieces, but right. there are areas they will work together. Um, I look at it, John, is like at the core, what is the biggest piece of IBM's business is services. That army of services, both from IBM and all of their SI partners and everybody they work with can really supercharge and help scale some of the environments that Red Hat's doing. Um, so really interesting. Expect them to talk a little bit about it. Red Hat is way more transparent than your average company. Mm -hmm. They had an analyst event like a week or two after it happened and I was really surprised how much they would tell us mm -hmm. and that we could talk about publicly. As I said, just because I've seen so many acquisitions happening, including some you know, mega ones in the past, and we know how little usually you talk about until it's, right. it's done and it's yeah. signed and mm -hmm. you know, the bankers and lawyers have been paid all their fees. Well, let me ask you, I mean, you raise an interesting point. Um, you know, there, there are some um, different approaches obviously, between IBM and Red Hat, just in terms of their institutional legacies, in terms of their processes. Red Hat, you mentioned, very transparent organization. Open source, right, so we're all about. Uh, they rebrand, uh, they come out, you know, they drop Shadow Man, they get the hat. Um, 
what's that cultural mix going to be like? Can they truly run independently? Yeah. They're a big piece. So, and if you're IBM, can you let that run on its own? So, John, that is the question most of us have. So, you know, I've worked with Red Hat for coming up on 20 years now. You know, remember when Linux was just this mess of kernel.org and so much changes and Red Hat came and gave you know, adult supervision to help move that forward. Um, the thing I, I wrote about is what Red Hat is really, really good at, if you look at the core they do, is managing that chaos and change out in the industry. If you look how many changes happen to Linux, mm -hmm. you know, every, you know, day, week, month, and they package all that together and they test all that. Same thing in Kubernetes, you know, same thing in so many different spaces where that open source world is just uh, frenetic and, and changing. So they're really geared for today's IT industry. You talk, what, what's the only constant in our industry, John, is it is change. Right. IBM, on the other hand, is like, you know, over 100 years old and right. the tried and true, you know, big blue. You know, I, I, IBM is this, you know, the big tanker, and you know, it's not like they turn on a dime and, you know, right. rapid pace of change. You think of IBM, you think of innovation, you think of, you know, trust, you, know, you think of all the innovations that have come out over the century plus mm -hmm. uh, do there, and absolutely there is a little bit of a impedance mismatch there, mm -hmm. and we'll see. So if IBM can truly let them do their own thing and not kind of merge certain groups and take over mm -hmm. where the inertia of a larger group can slow things down, I, I hope it will be successful. Um, but th there definitely are concerns, and time will tell. We will see, but you know, on the Linux front, uh, you know, uh, they just announced this morning, uh, RHEL 8, Red Hat Enterprise right, Linux so 8. You know, just got announced, and uh, definitely something we'll be spending a lot of time so talking it, about this week. So let's just jump into Rel 8 a little yeah. bit, and again, we're going to hear a little bit later on. Uh, we have several folks coming on board to talk about the, the availability now. Um, what what do you see from the outside looking at that? What is it going to allow you or us to do that Seven didn't? You know, where did they improve? Is it auto, on the automation side? Um, is it being maybe more attentive to a hybrid environment, or just what is it about Rel 8 that makes it that special? Yeah, so, you know, first of all, you know, these things take a while, and the nice thing about being open source is we've had transparency. If you wanted to know what was going to be in Rel 8, you just look in the kernel, and, and, and it's all out there. They've been working on this since 2013. Mm -hmm. Rel 7 came out back in June of 2014, so this has been a number of years in the mix. Um, you know, uh, security, the new, like, crypto policy is a big piece that, that, that's in there. Um, the, 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 the bullets that I got when I got the pre-briefing on it was, you know, faster and easier to deploy, faster onboarding for non-Linux users, uh, and, you know, seamless, non-destructive migration from earlier versions of RHEL. So that, that's one of the things they really want to focus on is that it needs to be predictable and I need to be able to move from one version to the other. If you look at the cloud world, uh, you know, when, when you don't go ask a customer and say, hey, uh, hey, what version of Azure AWS are you running on? You're running on the latest and greatest. But if you look at traditional shrink wrap software, it was, well, what version are you running? Well, I'm running N minus two. And why is that? Because I have to get it, I have to test it out, and then I you know, find a time that I'm going to roll that out and work it into my environment. So there is stability and understanding of the release cycle. Um, my understanding is that they're going to do major releases every three years and minor releases every six months, so that cadence, a little bit more like the cloud, and as I said, getting from one version of RHEL to the next should be easier and more non-disruptive. Uh, a lot of people are going to want managed offerings where they don't really think about this, I have the latest version, because that has not just the latest features, but the latest security settings, mm -hmm. which of course is a major piece of my infrastructure today to make sure that if there was some vulnerability released, I, I can't wait you know, six or nine months for me to bake that in there. Mm -hmm. The Linux community has always good at, done a good job of getting fixes into it, but how fast can I roll that out into my environment is something yeah, people yeah, want to I would assume that's, that's a major factor in any consideration right now is, is on the security front because every day we're hearing about one more problem and these aren't just small little issues. These are, these are, are could be multi-billion dollar problems. Um, but in terms of, of making products available today, how much more important, how's that security shift? If you could put a percentage on it, it used to be, you know, X and now it's X plus. I mean, I mean, what kind of considerations are being given to yeah, that Yeah, what, right what, what I'd say, it used to be that uh, security got great lip service. Uh, I said it was usually top of mind, but often towards bottom of budget. Um, when, when you talk to administrators and you say, oh, hey, where's your last security initiative? And they're like, ah, oh, I've had that thing sitting on my desk for the last six months and I haven't had a chance to roll I'll that out. I'll get to it. Um, I, I will get to it, but <laughs> once again, if I go to that cloud operating model, um, if you talk about, you know, the DevOps movement, 
is I need to bake security into the process. If I'm doing CI, CD, it's not I do something and then think about security afterwards. Security needs to be built in from the ground level. Uh, as uh, you know, I, I, I've heard people in the industry, security is everyone's responsibility and security must be baked in everywhere. So from the application all the way down to the chipset, we need to be thinking about security all along the board mine. It is a board level discussion. Mm -hmm. Any user you talk to, mm -hmm. you know, you don't say, hey, where's the security sit in your priorities? You know, it's up there towards the top, if not the top, um, because that's the thing that can put us out of business um, or you know, definitely ruin careers if, uh, uh, if it doesn't go right, so. There, there, are, there are probably um, a couple of uh, platforms, if you will, or pillars, I think you like to call them, uh, that, that you're looking forward to learning more about this week, I think, in terms of Red Hat's work. One of those being uh, hybrid cloud infrastructure. And yeah. we'll get to the other two in a little bit. But just your thoughts about how they're addressing that with the products that they offer and the services they offer and where they're going in that direction. Yeah, so, so look, everything for Red Hat starts with RHEL. Everything is built on Linux, and that's a good thing because Linux is everywhere. If uh, last year I was at Microsoft Ignite for the first time, and when you hear them talk, you know, Microsoft talking about how Linux is the majority of the environments. More than 50% of the environments are running Linux. Go to AWS, same thing. All the cloud deployments, Linux is the preferred substrate underneath, and RHEL doing very well to live in all those environments. Mm -hmm. So what we look at is, you know, some people say, is this a Linux show? It's like, well, at the core, Linux is the piece of it, and RHEL 8 the latest and greatest instantiation, mm -hmm. but everywhere you go, there's going to be Linux there. If I'm doing containerization, if I'm building on top of it with the, 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 the new cloud native models, it's there. Um, and if you talk about how I get from my data center to a multi-cloud environment, it's building things like Kubernetes, which Red Hat, of course, uses OpenShift, uh, and you know, those ties to AWS and Azure and you know, Google, uh, they're all there. So we mentioned Satya Nadella is on stage tonight. Mm -hmm. um, at Microsoft Build yesterday, uh, there was an announcement of this thing called KEDA, which is K-E-D-A, right. um, which has like Azure functions and ties in with OpenShift and I spent a little time squinting it and trying to tease it apart. We've got some guests this week that'll hopefully give some clarity, but it is, the answer is, People today have multiple clouds and they have a lot of different ways they want, they want to do things and Red Hat's going to make sure that they help bridge the gap and simplify those environments across the board. Two years ago when we were at the show, a big announcement about how OpenShift integrates with AWS so that if I'm using AWS but I want to have things in my environment and still leverage some of those services, that was something that, that Red Hat announced. I was you know, quite impressed uh, at, the, at the time. Um, it was you know, just last week being at the Dell show, it's VMware is the Dell strategy for how they get you know, AWS, GCP, and Azure, mm -hmm. and you know, Red Hat does that themselves. They are a software company, they live in all these cloud worlds, and therefore OpenShift will help you extend from your data center through all of those public cloud environments. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, yeah, it's, 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 so it's well, fascinating and stuff. And you've talked about Linux too. That, that we're going to hear a little bit later on too about a fascinating uh, global economic study that uh, Red Hat uh, commissioned with uh, IDC uh, that talks about this $10 trillion impact of Linux around the globe. Like to dive into that a little bit later on. Yeah, well, it, it, it's interesting. You know, I, it's uh, the, the 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 line I used is you say and you say, oh, well, how much impact has Linux had? You know, you know, Red Hat's now a three billion dollar company. That's good, but I was like, um, okay, let's just take Google. You know, no slouch of a company. Right. Google underneath. It's not Red Hat Linux, but Linux is the foundation. Don't really think that Google could become the global mm -hmm. search and advertising powerhouse they were if it wasn't for Linux to be able to help them get in that environment. There's, we, as we always talk with these technologies, you talk about Linux, you talk about Hadoop, you talk about you know, Kubernetes. There are companies that will monetize it, but the real value is what business models and creation by you know, all the enterprises and the mm -hmm. service providers mm -hmm. and the hyperscales that those technologies help enable. And that's where open source really shines is you know, the order of magnitude network effect that open source solutions have that it's, you, you say, okay, $3 billion, and you said, what, $10 trillion? Mm -hmm. um, doesn't phase me, doesn't surprise me at all. Doesn't at all. Um, but because got my we, attention. We, we, it, 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 <laughs> look, it, it, it's, I'm not trying to trivialize it or yeah, say right. no, but, you know, I, I've been watching Linux for 20 years and I've seen the ripples of that effect and if you dig down underneath, you're often finding it inside. I mentioned pillars that you were talking about, uh, 
cloud native development being another, but automation, let's just hit on that real quick before we head off. Um, and, and just again, uh, with how that is being, I guess, highlighted or, or that's a central focus at, uh, and rel eight and, and what automation, how that's playing in, and what they're, I guess the new efficiencies they're trying to squeeze out. Yeah, so, so what we always look for at shows, uh, yeah, probably the last year, is you know, you, how are they getting beyond the buzzwords of AI? Mm -hmm. When you talk about automation, uh, an area that, that we've really enjoyed digging into is uh, like robotic process automation. How do I take something that was manual and maybe it was efficient or not great, how can I make it? perfectly efficient, mm -hmm. and you use software robots to do that. So mm -hmm. where are there places where um, I know that the amount of change and the scale and the growth that we have, that I couldn't just put somebody at a keyboard you know, and have them typing, or mm -hmm. even a dashboard to be able to monitor and keep up with things, if I don't have the automation and intelligence in the system to manage things, I can't reach the scale and the growth that I need to. So where are you know, real solutions that are helping customers you know, get over a little bit of the fear of, oh my gosh, am I losing a job, or will this work, or will this keep my business running, mm -hmm. and oh my gosh, this will actually enable me to be able to grow, work on that security issue if I need to, rather than some of the other pieces, and help really allow IT agility to meet the requirements of what the business requires to help me move forward. So those are some of the things you know, we kind of look across the shows, so, you know, yeah, how much do we get you know, buzzword bingo at the show, or how much do we hear, you know, real customers with real solutions uh, digging in and having, you know, new technologies that a couple of years ago would have had us saying, wow, that's magic. Yep, well, what do you say, oh my gosh. <laughs> and not oh my gosh. All right, back with more. You're watching us here in theCUBE at the Red Hat Summit. We're in Boston, Massachusetts, and we'll be back with more coverage right after this.